Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. And welcome to today's webinar, Application and Answers with High Spatial and Spectral Resolution UAV Imagery. There are a couple notices before we start. I've muted the phone lines for all attendees. So if you have any questions at any point during the webinar, feel free to enter them into the questions chat box, and we'll try to answer as many as we can get to at the end of the presentation. We are recording this webinar, and we'll have it up on our website at www.harrisgeospatial.com and at www.micasense.com in the next couple of days. We'll also email you a link to the recording, as well as the slide deck, which you are welcome to share with your colleagues. So my name is Megan Gallagher, and I am a solutions engineer with L3 Harris Geospatial. I work with a lot of different remote sensing technologies, and I'm really excited to be talking about this presentation today. I am also joined uh, today by Callum Scoogle, uh, who is a sales engineer at MicaSense. Uh, Callum, would you like to talk a little bit more about yourself? Sure, yeah. I'm working in Seattle at the moment with MicaSense. I'm originally from the UK, and I spend a lot of my time working with advanced researchers, software partners, and dealing with multispectral processing and analysis. Fantastic. Thank you. So we're going to go into a little bit of background on both of our companies and then jump into the presentation itself. So for myself, I work for L3 Harris. L3 Harris Technologies is a global aerospace and defense technology innovator with over 400 locations worldwide and over 50,000 employees. In particular, our group, work, our group works with geospatial solutions, be this from commercial geospatial analytics to data and imagery or even machine learning technologies to find solutions for answers that a lot of people are asking in this day and age. For this presentation, we are gonna be focusing on Envy. So we have more than 30 years of experience of developing scientifically proven solutions using cutting edge technology. And one of those is Envy, which is a software platform used for the analysis and processing of multiple kinds of imagery, be that multispectral, hyperspectral, satellite drone, you name it. Uh, there are many other offerings, such as uh, Starscape Processing, uh, Code Engine IDL, and as you can see on this lovely screen. But today we're going to be working on using this platform to pull out unique information that you can use for whatever kind of answers that you seek. And with that, I'm going to pass it back over to Callum. Yeah, so at MicaSense, we're a, a group of engineers, remote sensing scientists, and geospatial specialists. We're at the forefront of drone sensor development and have been building sensors since 2014. We're based in Seattle, Washington in the USA, and we have a global presence in over 70 countries through our reseller network. Our products are platform agnostic, so they integrate with most drones and our data can be processed in a range of third-party software and suites. Our customers are typically monitoring, mapping, analyzing data in a range of environments, such as agriculture, forestry, conservation, and coastal areas. Before we go on into the, the nitty gritty, it would be great just to run a, a quick poll to get an overview of which remote sensing methods you guys are using. So the question should be up there now, and the question is, which remote sensing methods do you utilize? Is it satellite, manned aircraft, drones, or a combined approach. And we'll just give 20 or 30 seconds here for you all to answer. Okay, so interesting results coming in so far. We've got 31% with satellite, 29% with drones, and 38% with combined approach, uh, only 3% with manned aircraft. So yeah, hopefully, hopefully this information is gonna be really useful to you guys. So let's see if we can uh, move on to the next slide. I closed it, I don't know why it's still stuck there. Sorry about that, you guys. Looks like we're having a technical difficulty with the poll. <laughs> As it's closed. 
You can't move on to the next screen. Megan, can you move on to the next screen at all? I'm doing that. It's just only showing the poll. Well, that's fun. There we go. All right, fix the technical difficulties. <laughs> okay, so we are back. So the dual camera system is essentially uh, the dual camera system is a combination of 10 multispectral bands across the spectrum. It's taking our existing Red Edge MX sensor and combining it with a new Red Edge MX Blue sensor. What this allows us to do is to capture 10 narrow wave bands across the spectrum, which have been chosen to directly mirror the wavelengths of Landsat and Sentinel data. This allows us to be able to conduct direct satellite comparisons between our drone data and satellite data sources. It's ideal for advanced research and analytics um, within fields such as agriculture, vegetation, analysis, conservation, and land and water management. Just go to the next slide, please. So it easily integrates with uh, DJI drones. Um, there's also a VTOL integration with Quantum Trinity, which is that picture in the top right there. And we also have a bracket option, which can allow for alternative fixed wing mounting options to be used. Just go to the next slide, please. So here you can see um, an overview of where our bands are in relation to Landsat 8 and Sentinel 2A. We'll just take a, a brief moment to kind of go through them. So you can see we have the red edge MX and you can see our existing bands there. We've got the blue, green, red, a red edge and a near infrared band. Within our new MX blue sensor, we've got a new coastal blue band, a new green band, a red band and two red edge bands. Our dual camera system allows these two sensors to be integrated. So you're capturing pixel aligned 10 band data on each of your flights. The coastal blue band we have has been a highly requested feature from those interested in monitoring riparian vegetation and shallow water environments. The combined bands of the red and red edge, so we've got four bands within that portion of the spectrum, are really useful for agricultural and vegetation analysis. We can create an NDVI type index using our band six and our red edge band nine. This is a really useful index as it's less prone to saturation and there's much greater sensitivity to chlorophyll variation at high concentrations. Having these 10 bands allows us to create many, many indices. Um, you can have your traditional ones from which you're familiar if you come from satellite sources. Uh, but you could also create your own custom indices for the classification tasks you're interested in. This solution is it's ideal for researchers who maybe want to analyze a site and directly compare with satellite data. Um, you know, it's, it's even better for those who maybe they have a site which they're interested in, they're monitoring it, but they need, they need much higher spec, uh, spatial resolution data. So, you know, you, you go in, you do your flight, and you're able to get the benefits of higher spatial resolution to detect the features and classify things that you're interested in, but you get to keep that spectral range which you're used to from satellite data sources. Like I said, it, it's perfectly suited for classification tasks and the ability to essentially capture data almost pixel to feature level means that it's really easy to get rid of things that you're not interested in. So. It's very straightforward to get rid of soil, shadows, etc., and gives you the ability and the time to focus on developing classification methods or algorithms or tools to classify the things you're interested in, whether they're plants or vegetation. Having those 10 bands means you can create more accurate classifications and models, uh, especially if you're, it's especially useful if you're interested in using machine learning algorithms and AI workflows, such as CNNs or single shot detectors. 
go to the next slide, please. So in terms of our spectral quality, all of our bands are narrow wavelength bands, which is it's really important because it means that we don't have any overlaps or duplication within the spectrum. Having those narrow wavelength bands means that we can capture very specific or localized regions of the spectrum, which in turn means that we can detect subtle changes in the phenomena which we're mapping. And that could be really important at different times of the year um, to, to capture those changes. If you have broadband uh, bands, then you know you might miss those subtle changes and you might get an overall picture, which is okay, but you, you'll miss those subtle changes, which are really, really important in advanced analysis. So we also go through a rigorous quality control on all of our filters and our sensors and accessories which come with that. So one of the quality control operations that we conduct is on our DLS2, which is a downwelling light sensor. That's really important because the sensor allows us to measure the sun angle using eight directional sensors whilst we're flying the drone. That in turn means we can compensate for changing lighting conditions based on things like clouds and the direction of the drone, which can give you much better, more accurate data. Even more so is our calibration, our radiometric correction and the use of our calibrated reflectance panels. That allows you to radiometrically correct your data, uh, essentially using known reflectance values off that panel across the visible and near infrared spectrum. This is uh, this is definitely the best approach in terms of generating precise, repeatable measurements, which allow you to conduct high quality temporal analysis. You can also see our center wavelengths there on that graph in comparison to Landsat-A and Sentinel-2A. Uh, just go to the next slide, please. So yeah, we'll, we'll talk a little bit now about some of the uses and applications of some of the bands, of, of the new bands that we have. So like we mentioned before, we've got a coastal aerosol blue band that's being used for classifying things like aquatic reeds or invasive species. Very useful for shallow stream bathymetric change mapping. And you can also um, be looking at things like suspended sediment concentration, turbidity, and algal blooms. Um, we've got a lot of people who are interested, especially in looking at freshwater quality and things like lakes and rivers and algal blooms and eutrophication and those kind of elements which come from runoff from agriculture are are feeding a lot of interest uh, in terms of that ability to map, and monitor those changes, which may or may not be happening depending on time of year and nutrient runoff, et cetera, into our water bodies. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, our band seven, Red Edge 705, this has been identified as being superior for detecting chlorosis and is great for uh, detecting leaf roll and leaf blotch as well. Uh, within the literature, it indicates that it's key in identifying micro and macro nutrient deficiencies. Next slide, please. So yeah, our Red Edge 740, band nine, this directly matches our Sentinel-2A Red Edge band. And having this allows us to develop the Red Edge position index. Having these having multiple bands within the red edge spectrum gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of monitoring and mapping vegetation, especially within agriculture. Um, you know, you can create three different types of NDRE using these. Um, in combination with all of our bands, we can create new useful indices such as MTC, I, MCA, RI, and a whole, whole range of others, which I think Megan will, will go into more detail to when we get there. Um, one of the bands I haven't mentioned is our is the new green band, which is very useful for detecting things like leaf blotch and fungal diseases, and is really good for physiology studies. So you can develop a, a PRI index, which is probably the most physiologically rooted index within the 
the visible and near infrared spectrum. Um, very good for detecting vegetation productivity and, and stress within it. Okay, next slide, please. So our dual camera system, once you've flown and you've captured all the images, it's pretty much standard processing from there. If you're used to our previous uh, sensors, such as the Red Edge MX and the Altum, it's, you can take that data straight into Pix4D Mapper or Adusoft Photoscan, or, sorry, MetaShape, and you can process it within that photogrammetry suite as you did before. We also offer, um, we also have open source tools to conduct the radio metric calibration yourself. So those tools are on GitHub and within the Python language. And basically that's it's probably more useful towards advanced researchers who maybe they want a little bit more control over the radio metric calibration process. Maybe they want to, maybe you want to tweak a few bits and pieces here and there. Um, that gives you that flexibility to do that if, if that's something you're interested in. Once you've calibrated your images, whether that's within the existing third-party software like Pix4D, Hadusoft, or our GitHub materials, and you've generated your output, such as your point clouds and your orthophotos, what we then do then is take an orthophoto from that, and then we're ready to start analyzing and developing our classifications or our models to see whether we can you know, classify or detect the features that we're interested in. At this point, I'm going to hand you over to Megan, who's going to showcase how NV can be used with our dual camera system to do this. Thank you, Callum. Uh, yeah, so let's get started. First, I'm going to draw you in with this gorgeous picture, and we'll get back to it at the end. So to build off some of the stuff that Callum was saying, especially all of the bands that are included with the dual camera system, the first thing we're going to be talking about are bands and a lot of different spectral indices. So we did bring up a few of these, but just for a bit of background, spectral indices are mathematical formula that use two or more wavelengths to highlight specific features, including things like vegetation, uh, mineralogy, uh, burn area, urban areas, etc. And it all depends upon the kind of wavelengths that you have in your imagery. So Envy itself comes with over 65 prepackaged spectral indices, covering a wide range of these physical and chemical characteristics. And you can see on the image to the right, that's just a few of the vegetation, and I think I see snow in there, uh, analysis indices that exist in Envy. And at the bottom, there is an example of what a spectral index would look like in its mathematical formula. So some of the spectral indices that are included in Envy, like in vegetation, you have things such as narrowband greenness, canopy nitrogen, uh, leaf pigmentation. In geology, things such as mineralogy, iron, soil indices miscellaneous ones such as water, snow, and mud, which worked really well with these new bands that are included with the dual camera system. And if there are specific features that you're trying to pull out or that band math that you've created yourself, you can also import these into Envy itself. And we are going to be spending the rest of the time on using these spectral indices and how you can pull out this information with the MicaSense dual camera system. But first, we have another poll question for you. And hopefully this one will go through nice and easy as opposed to the last one. So the poll question is, which category best describes your main application for vegetation mapping? Is it land management, aquatic and coastal environmental conservation, forestry, phenotyping or agricultural research, or other? All right, we're going to let this go for a couple more seconds. And that is it. We have closed the poll. And we are now going to share the results. And we can see over a very large amount of people using this for land management and phenotyping. So I think you guys are really going to like the focus of this presentation. For the aquatic and coastal environments as well, that's really exciting to see. We actually have a pretty even spread, honestly, with most people in land and phenotyping. But and there's also that other category that always really interests me. So I think you guys are going to be really interested by what we're about to show you here in this presentation. 
and the poll worked. Fantastic. All right, so uh, this is an image, uh, as it would be, from the Micasense dual camera system, and it is one we're going to be working with a lot in the upcoming slides. As you can see, we have a lot of grass. We have at least two different types of trees that I can visually tell just by looking at this image. We have a road to the left-hand side, and then we have some ground reflectance on the bottom right-hand side. And we do have shadows and a darker grass patch in the middle. And so we're gonna be using this a lot. How spectral indices and envy work is you load in your data set into a spectral indices tool, such as seen on the right, and it will automatically check the wavelengths that you have included and let you know which spectral indices can be calculated. So in this case, we can see there are 48 different spectral indices that we can get from this uh, imagery. And once you, you can say, yes, I want every single one, or you can choose which specific spectral indices that you would like to have. And you can either create a file, or in this case, I'm using a virtual raster, which is uh, just not saved onto the disk. And we're gonna load it up and take a look at all these different kinds of spectral indices and the unique kind of information they can give us. And so here's one of the, the thing that pops up immediately is this gorgeous, strangely colored picture. What this is, is actually three different spectral indices as the red, green, and blue bands in the image. And they are, at the moment, the atmospherically resistant vegetation and anthocyanin reflectance indexes two and one. And we're already able to see that specific features are being colored in very specific ways. And this means as we go through and onto the next slide, we're gonna be able to see what each of these features highlights and understand what we can use to pull out from them and how we can pick out these specific features. So in Envy, you can also take all those spectral indices and run them as a video or as an animation. Uh, I do this really often. If I'm trying to see which bands I should be using or which indices I should be using to pull out very specific information. And it also makes really great uh, GIFs and videos to you know post on wherever you'd like to have them or to get more of an understanding of the scene you're looking at. So we just went through all 48 of the spectral indices that I was able to pull out of the uh, imagery. To get a non-GIF view on that, let's take a look at uh, three of them in particular. So on the top left-hand side of the screen, we have the true color image. Directly right of that, we have enhanced vegetation index or commonly known as EVI. This is used to pick out different vegetation responses. And as you can see, we're getting a very large response from some of the trees and from the grassy area. On the bottom left-hand corner, uh, we have the anthocyanin index. Uh, anthocyanin is common in plants that are blue or red or purple. And so this will respond higher when there are things of this color. And on the right, we have the mud index. And as you can see, the road and a lot of areas in the grass, actually, as well as the area of ground we saw previously, are responding higher to this, showing that there is more of a ground response. And so that's just some examples of the features we can pull out very easily just from running the spectral index. Now, as Callum said earlier, one of the coolest things, in my opinion, I mean, there's a lot of cool things about this camera system, but one of the coolest things is the compatibility with satellites. And so here I have, I chose a pixel of grass from the MicaSense camera system, as well as one from a Sentinel-2 image, and, did a, and plotted both of the spectrum of the grass together. The, spec, the Sentinel-2 image is from about three or four days uh, later than the MicaSense one. And so that is, there will be a little change as well as something I will talk about in a couple slides later. But as we can see through most of the wavelengths, we have very good matching in between the two. And so just to pull in an example of how compatible these are, I also did the Sentinel-2 spectral indices of the same kinds. So on the top left-hand corner, we have a much lower resolution uh, image over the same area. On the right-hand side, we have the EVI, or the Enhanced Vegetation Index, where we have a very strong response for the grass, once again, and for some of the trees. On the bottom left-hand corner, we have the anthocyanin, once again, pulling out some of those specific tree features. 
And then on the bottom right, we have the MUD index. Now this one's pretty interesting uh, because it, it looks really odd. And the reason this is, is because for the MUD index in using the Sentinel-2 data, you're using a much lower resolution that has to be uh, downsampled to match the 10 meter data. So you can see that there is some blocking in there, but we're overall able to get the results out. So one of the things I was uh, talking about was there's a little bit of change in between the MicaSense and a couple of the, or one of the Sentinel-2 data sets or data points in the wavelengths. And this is uh, most likely because of one of the date change and two because of that resolution change. So the resolution change from having that centimeter, sub centimeter pixel value versus having up to a 60 meter one can cause for a lot of other information to be input into the Sentinel-2 data, and that's why there's such a big gap. All right, and with that background done, we're gonna jump into pulling out features with these spectral indices, because I've been talking about it a lot, so I might as well show you how to do it. So the first one we're going to do is actually a really easy way, which I don't even know would technically count as a classification, but it works really well, especially if you're going to build a classification off of it. So we're gonna be using the image on the right-hand side of the screen. And you can see that the specific trees that I'm looking at are highlighted in this sort of lilac color. Now I chose the spectral indices together just to make them that much more noticeable. The tool we're gonna to use in this case is actually just a simple scatter plot tool. What this does is it will take a look at the image and you can have your band set up to show you where all the pixel values are on the wavelength in comparison in a scatter plot. So let's say I, on the left-hand image, zoom all the way into one of those purple trees. I can then see the overall plot of the color response. By exploring the scene a little bit, I can see where those pixel values are, and then I can highlight them in the scatter plot as seen on the right. And now if you look at the background image, you can see that most of that purple area is now highlighted in bright red. And if I was to zoom out again, suddenly most of those purple trees are now classified. They are part of a class. And this is because I was just able to zoom in, see what those pixel responses are, very easily draw a circle around them, and then I automatically am able to just say everything else that matches or is, is within this range is now part of this class as well. If you take a look at the scatter plot tool that's shown on the upper right hand corner of both of these images, you'll be able to see that very small red area, and that is all of the pixels that are included in this uh, system. So in this classification. And on the right, we can also see it in comparison to the true color image. So you can take this response and I mean, you could just use it. You can also use it for further classification or to create uh, shape files. So on to further classification. There are a lot of different classification techniques that are available. Um, the two main groupings are unsupervised and supervised. An unsupervised classification does not use any user input. It will classify based off of groupings of pixel statistics together. And this is a good technique to use to get to know your imagery or to separate out unique features. In fact, the image on the bottom of the screen right now is an unsupervised ISO data classification of that same image. And you can see it actually did a really good job with the grass and separating it out from the trees. And so one thing I might do is I might run this ISO data classification. And if I was really only interested in the trees, I might make a mask using that grass data classification and just cover it up so it isn't part of any of my further steps. There's a lot of different things you can do with it for separating out these unique features. On the opposite end of the scale, uh, a supervised classification needs user input. This is either regions of interest or spectral information on features that you know. And it will use that to find similar pixels and to set bounds to what actually counts as those features. So say for once again, the picture on the bottom, it would be grass, one tree type, two tree type, the road, et cetera. You would want examples of what all those are. Envy also comes with classification cleanup tools such as smoothing, sieving, and clumping because Whenever you classify something, there will be noise, there will be speckles. And so if you want to clean up uh, your imagery, you'll be able to do that in it as well. The classification technique I'm going to be talking about uh, today is called Spectral Angle Mapper, or SAM. And this works really well for multispectral or hyperspectral data sets. So I was really excited to use it with this data. 
And it will create, uh, it will use those unique spectral features to pull out the other features that you're trying to find, like I said, uh, tree type, roads, etc. How it works is it checks the similarity in between an input spectrum, so a wavelength spectrum of roads, let's say, and the entirety of all the pixel spectrum in your image. It creates an n-dimensional angle between them. So think of it as the amount of bands you have is the amount of angles you're gonna pull out. It will check this angle similarity between every band portion, and if it's close enough, it will be classified as that type of feature. So taking a look at the image on the bottom right, we can see we have image spectrum, which is material A, and reference spectrum, which is material B. So reference spectrum is the one that you've input, and then it's gonna go through and check the image and see how close it is to the reference spectrum. If that angle is really small, that means they're very similar, and they are most likely the same feature. So let's get into how you actually pick these out. So there's a bunch of different ways, and I'll go into some of the spectral libraries in a little bit because that's one of my favorite things, but you can also just pick them out from your imagery itself. And if you have, like, if you collected stuff from the ground and you have, like, points that you can put those in, but in this case, I just used the image. So you can load up a spectral profile and say, pick on the road, for example, and you will actually automatically pull out that spectral profile to use for classification. When you're doing this, you want to click on a pure pixel. So as you notice, I clicked on the middle of the road as opposed to the side, which has a little bit of dirt or even getting the influence of some grass because you want this pixel to be as pure as possible to make sure that you can do a proper classification. And you can continue to do this for other features. So for this example, I have done six features. So grass, road, ground, tree type one, tree type two, and shadow, and I, said uh, tree type one and two because I cannot show type of trees from air uh, at this point in time yet. So, but we can actually also use this for some information on our classification itself before we even start. If we take a look at grass and tree type one, we can see that they are pretty similar in the lower wavelength. So we know that there might be some confusion, whereas in the higher wavelengths, we're um, seeing that there is a bit of difference in between them that will allow us to hopefully differentiate them. Similarly with road and ground, once again, in the lower wavelengths, they're very similar reflectance responses. And in the higher one, we're, we have a big gap in between them. And so we can see early on before going in that we are going to have to take a look at what are these changes, what's going to be occurring here, and how are we gonna separate these out? So to run SAM, what you need to do is say the kind of the image that you want to put in, in this case, that is the uh, MicroSense dual camera system image, and then the spectrum that you're going to compare it to. And so we have grass, road, ground, tree type one, tree type two, and shadow. Once that's done, you can run it with a maximum angle and radiance. Now for this example, I set it to single value. What this means is it's going to look at an angle of similarity, but if it hits that maximum angle, then it no longer counts as that class. If you're trying to do a little bit more um, specific features, you can switch that to the multiple values button, which is on the right hand side of the single values, where you can say like, oh, I know this one feature is taking up a lot and it's not actually that feature. You can reduce that angle so you can say less of the image is that feature itself. But in this case, we just did a simple single value all the way through. And here's what our output looks like. So remember, this is using one pixel for every single kind of classification or every single class here. We have grass, uh, as we thought we would see, we have a little bit of grass mixed up with tree type one. Uh, we have very good coverage actually with tree type two and a little bit of road and ground mix up, but we're also able to pick up a lot of the shadows that were occurring along the way as well. I also ran this technique using a spectral index image. So just a bunch of spectral indices on top of each other. And we actually get a better, better differentiation in between the grass and that is technically true type one. I mistyped it on this one uh, than we did previously, as well as very good differentiation for tree type two. And so this is just showing that with the spectral indices and all this information added, 
and even more information that you can add, you're able to pick out a lot of these unique features really easily. So I said the word spectral indice or spectral library before, and I'm going to go over what that means now. So Envy comes with multiple spectral libraries already available. What these are, they're their spectrum of a whole bunch of different things like vegetation, minerals, man-made features that are usually done in a lab or with a hyperspectral camera. And so you have very high spectral resolution imagery data sets. So for the example on the screen right now, it's a dry grass, Jasper Ridge, grassland, soil, coyote bush, and there's a lot more than just that. You can use these then to actually help with your classifications or with other techniques, and you can make your own. So if you have a specific spectra that you've collected, or like me, you clicked on points in the ground and you said, all right, these are the things that I'm looking for, especially with this high resolution, you can bring those in as your own libraries and use them in multiple scenes. So one really cool example about that is actually material identification. So I said I couldn't tell what kinds of tree types they were, but I decided to see if maybe I could get a clue on that using their similarities to known spectra. So uh, what I did is I input my tree type two as a signature. I said, look through every single spectral library that we have and let me know what's closest to it. And NV automatically shows on the right-hand side the tree type two spectral response. And then in this case, it said the closest thing we have to that is the coastal sage response. And the band import shows the difference in between the two. And if we look at the bottom right, we're able to see the closest features to the one that was imported. So we can see it has coastal sage, sagebrush, saltbrush, leather oak, and rabbit brush as the closest things to that particular tree type. Now, once again, I can't tell tree vegetation from the air, unfortunately, but this is a really useful tool if you're trying to pick out unique features or get an understanding of what's happening in a scene, especially if you can like tell tree type from the air and kudos to you. So, uh, we have been focusing a lot on vegetation, especially in forestry, uh, but that's not to say, like Callum said, there's a lot of really cool things, especially with that coastal blue band now. Uh, this is that really pretty image I showed at the beginning, so I'll finish off with it as well. And what this is, is it is using a technique called Principal Component Analysis, or PCA. What PCA does is it goes through a process and pretty much removes redundant band information meaning that instead of having our 10 bands, once PCA is complete, we have our 10 like red, green, blue, red edge, red edge bands. We no longer have those. It uses the information from those to create an entirely new set of bands that don't actually have like physical imagery characteristics. But what it does do is it picks out unique information that is shown in an image and gives you a lot more background on those kind of unique things that you can pull out. And in this case, we ran this over the water and uh, I mean, just looking from this image itself, you can see there's a lot of unique information that we're already able to see from the water itself. So for things like bathymetry, for looking at algae, that kind of stuff, you're already able to see that you are gonna be able to bring out a lot of unique characteristics from these systems just by running a PCA program to see what kind of unique features that you have. All right, and with that, that is the end of our presentation. So we'll address some of the questions that have come in. Um, as a reminder, you guys can send us a question by using the questions chat box in the GoToWebinar dashboard. All right, and let's start. Oh, here's a good one for you, Callum. Will the sample data shown be available for download? Uh, yes, absolutely. If, if anyone's interested, um, just reach out to us after the webinar and we can provide a, a link to that data. Fantastic. Uh, I have one. Uh, are spectral libraries a tool within Envy? Yes, they are. Uh, they are a tool and all the libraries that you saw on the screen are included, as well as you can download and create your own. So they are just part of Envy itself. Let's see. I've got another question for you, Callum. What is the spatial resolution of the drone imagery? So for that particular flight, it was um, around about eight centimeters. So at a flying altitude of 120 meters, you're gonna get eight centimeters resolution. 
obviously if you fly lower you, you can get higher resolution as well and vice versa thank you and i've got a pretty cool question that i sort of want to know the answer to as well which is can we use this data and this camera for geologic studies and how do you feel about like because you we spoke about water and forestry but how about for soil surfaces and rock surfaces yeah i mean I, I don't see why not i mean if you can if you can pick up a that different spectral response among the bands then there'd be no reason not to one of the one of the interesting things we found in one of our um sites which was was actually that last image you showed there but we we reflew it a few few weeks ago was this seemed to be um yeah that's the exact one so the later flight after this one there seemed to be when I first looked at the ortho for a very distinct orange area coming into the water and around the ground area, pretty much the bottom right corner of that, of the, the, the superimposed image there. And somebody actually went and checked that area a few days after, and it seemed to be some sort of iron oxide naturally being released from the ground going into the river. And we could detect that response easily using the dual camera system. Fantastic. And yay for us people who really, really like geology. <laughs> Let's see. Um, all right, I've got another one for you, which is what are some of the water-based as opposed to rock-based applications that the sensor is being used for? Yeah, so I mentioned earlier on, people are interested in looking at shallow stream bathymetry for sure. We've also got people who are looking um, at monitoring eelgrass, coastal areas. I touched on the kind of algal blooms and lakes as well. Um, a lot of people are interested in that kind of eutrophication from runoff. And yeah, I mean, this is this is the first summer or the first season, I guess, in which the dual camera system is available. So um, I think, yeah, just keep your keep your eyes open for more sam sample data and case studies because we're getting more and more of it as the days go on. Nice. That is, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what's going to be showing up pretty soon. Uh, I have a couple questions about SAM. Uh, the first one is, how did you pick out the shadow swell in the SAM classification? And did you treat the shadows as a separate class? I did. Um, usually when I'm doing a SAM classification or another technique, if I have apparent shadows, I do like to make them their own class. Because a lot of the times, as we all know, shadows can cause noise uh, and it's, you know, you sort of want to separate them out. In some cases, depending upon actually some of the spectral indices shown, it was really able, it was very easily able to actually categorize the shadows. And so it just depends more on, you know, the kind of shadows that you have in your scene. In this case, it worked really well to actually pick out those shadows. And if I wanted to, I could have just masked them out of the image entirely. Another one was asking about the maximum angle that was included in the SAM classification. And yes, that is, uh, it was like a 0.1, I believe. I can go back to that slide real quick. Uh, the 0.1 of the maximum angle radians, that is just what it's set at in Envy. Um, you can make it lower than that if you want to make things more unique, but you will end up probably with some more unclassified pixels as well. Let's see. I'm gonna take a look for some more questions. I have a general drone question, if you want to answer it, Callum. It is, uh, what kind of atmospheric weather conditions can the drone operate in? Um, I think that's, yeah, that's very dependent, I think, on the platform you're flying. If, you've, if you're flying a, a very small uh, quadcopter, it might not be as robust as a larger one, for example. So I think that would really depend on the system you're, you're flying. And so uh, we can probably answer a couple more. There's a bunch streaming in, so I'm trying to... Okay. Um... What are some potential applications for urban area indices? 
and I think we both can have a, a little bit to say on this one if you'd like. Uh, I can start or you can if you want to go ahead. Yeah, sure, go for it. Yeah, so urban area indices show up built up area and so things like new construction. Uh, so if you're flying over an area and you're trying to see if there's like construction or classifying change, that's the first thing that really pops into my head of using an urban area indice because you can pick up things like, oh, there's a parking lot or there's a new building. And if you're doing uh, just maybe you want to classify all the new buildings that are created in a city or you want to see where they are and overlay them on a map. Those are things that I've used the urban area index for before. Yeah, I think I'd be in agreement in that. I think one of the interesting things, I think, if you were using those kind of in indices is that just the very nature of looking at change, I think you would, you would notice massive differences in the spectral profile between an area, say, which is, a, say, it's a car park, and then it suddenly becomes a building. You're going to be able to pick up on that spectral difference, and you're going to be able to notice that very easily between subsequent flights. Hmm. All right. Uh, in your experience, how well can the MicaSense sensors interpret soil properties with grass coverage? So, like, can you see what's happening in the soil underneath if there is a layer of grass on top? Oof. I know that's a cool one. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% sure on that one. I mean, I guess, you know, it's you're picking up that spectral response from the reflection of the light and absorption and transmission from that, you know, feature on the ground. And can that penetrate through the top layer of grass? I'm not sure. What it could do, perhaps, is detect, um, you know, areas of higher vigor or weaker vigor, which might be indicative of poorer quality soil, perhaps. Um, beneath the surface. But that's an interesting one. We'll have a, maybe we can have a discussion about that offline and go into a bit more detail on it. That, that, that one's gonna be a fun one. Let's see if we can see what's underneath all of the grass. So let's yeah. See. Let's see, oh, I, here's a really good question. I'm actually gonna go back a few slides. Uh, a few, just a lot, all of them. Um, what does the 444-10 mean on this slide near the band one? Yeah, so that's just the central wave band there. If you, there's a table, um, if you go back one slide, I think, where you've got, um, yeah, you've got that central wave band and then the, uh, yeah, the range which that encompasses. So you've got a central wave band and the range either side of that as well to show the region of the spectrum which we're looking at. Fantastic, yeah, good good question. All the way back to the end. <laughs> Not that far to the end. Uh, and I'll probably, we'll probably do two more questions. Um, Let's see, uh, here's a question for you. Is the dual camera mounted, rigid mounted, mounted rigidly? Rigidly mounted together. Rigidly mounted together. I think it has to do with the, like are both cameras, you know, alignment so, of them for the the band overlap. Yeah, so in terms of the band overlap, the, the two cameras, they're essentially kind of connected together as you mount it onto your drone or your fixed wing. And the imagery, every image or every band which is generated, they're all pixel aligned. So they're all taken at the exact same moment. So when you take that into photogrammetry and align them all, everything will be completely in line with each other. Perfect. And let's see, I'm gonna grab one more question. Let's see, oh, here's a good one. Um, in what season do the NV vegetation spectral libraries represent? Most of them are lab collected, so they'll be using a spectral radiometer in a lab to collect them. Otherwise, they are from such as the USGS, and that will have uh, information on when those specific things are collected as well. And not just the USGS, a bunch of other sources, but just as an example. 
And so it will be able to give you background on those, but most of them are from a lab, which is a great thing to know because anything you collect in the field is going to be different from what you collect in a lab, just in any way, shape or form. You've got uh, ideal conditions versus hopefully no popcorn clouds. All right, and with that, um, we are going to wrap things up. Uh, if we haven't got to your questions, we'll answer those offline. We appreciate everyone's attention on the line and thank you again, Callum. Just a reminder <laughs> that a recording of this webinar and the slides will be emailed to you in the next couple of days. It will also be available on our site at www.harrisgeospatial.com and at www.micasense.com. And we encourage you to share it with your colleagues. Thank you everyone and have a great rest of your day.